Hello, my name is Francis Pinder, and you are watching or listening, perhaps, to the Salesforce Posse podcast, where I speak to influencers in the Salesforce ecosystem. And in this conversation, I'm going to be talking with Ines Garcia, who I've known for many years. But when I first met her, she was working in the Salesforce ecosystem with a passion for Agile. But now she is not only the author of two amazing books, Becoming More Agile Whilst Delivering Salesforce and Sustainable Happy Profit, but also she's an Agile coach, a Salesforce MVP, and is helping organizations to build in a sustainable way so they can have a positive and better impact on the well-being of the communities and the planet we live in. If you are interested in Agile or how sustainability really can be a force of good within companies, then I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this conversation with Innes. So let's get on to it. Hello, Innes, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, Francis. Thank you for having me. No, great. I think God, it seems like forever since we last saw each other, I think, because you did London's Calling a couple of times, but it's like since then, it's just been virtual craziness, I think. It has, that's well for us and for many more. You actually, the talks you've done at Dreamforce all around agile and you're living in this kind of agile world. But, you know, there's, I think a lot of my students I have, and a lot of people that listen to this may use agile in a way or not heard of it before. And I think, Oh, well, for, even for me, it's like there's loads of different frameworks out there and methodologies and ways of working, I suppose, from, you know, extreme programming, kind of Kanban, Agile, Scrum, and then also the kind of more traditional ones like, you know, Prince2, PMP. And I think it's like, well, why Agile, I think, and what, what are the benefits of it? Big question. I suppose Agile, like other names, comes with a lot of baggage. What I find often when I go to help organizations and teams is that there is a sense of there may be doing Agile, but what I see and the results are not fermenting in a way that they would expect to or one would expect with the principles that those frameworks bring. So in a very simple manner, what I like to do sometimes is just to drop the name at all. Um, I tend to refer to, to a colleague's quote of what we're trying to do here is to deliver better value, do that sooner, safer, happier. At the end of the day, that's the aim. I don't know if you're the same with me. It's, it's like there's all these different ways of doing things, but actually you can use elements from all of them really to kind of really support what the business and the objectives of the business are trying to get out to support the team, the same as you. But it can become a, and I think yeah, it's quite good where you're dropping the word agile because then it kind of sets you in this kind of mindset of that's the way I should be working, which may not be the benefit for the business. I don't know if that makes sense. In a sense, like think that this Agile has been around for more than 20 years. People that they were already developing software in different ways than the more traditional and standardized manner. They came together, they dropped their differences, they left them like in the other side of the door, and they discussed what were the commonalities of the things that they were doing differently. And that's where the Agile Manifesto emerged. And for whoever is listening to this, if you haven't checked it out, please go to agilemanifesto.org. And have a look about the about why were they there, what they were trying to achieve. And so when things become trendy, it's very easy for core of the content to dilute. And I think it's if you haven't had the greatest experience with a hype of Agile, unfortunately, that may be a reason of your experience. So there is a better way and there are hope out there. So, so what are the common things that you kind of notice when you work with companies that say they're doing agile, but it's fragile or it's just not quite achieving? What are the kind of common things that you kind of see or within the projects? Some of the anti-patterns, I suppose we could call it, is that we expect to be able to foresee the future. And if anything, over the last 24 months, we have proven wrong. That ain't going to happen. Um, if we look at natural systems, um, we can get inspired how nature works in a sense that nature is built to adapt to change, to have storm and the trees still being able to flex. So how can we mimic some of those concepts in the way that we organize ourselves and in the way that we build the products and services that we put to market? 
So is that because the first book you did was all around Agile and you like you talk about the Agile manifesto and the people that came together at that point, which I kind of found you know, really interesting. How did that connect into your sustainability and Agile and how does that kind of fit into the same world, I suppose? The same world, the common denominator is me. <laughs> I work for myself and I struggle to put myself into a box because I have really wide interest of different things. Like the first product I kind of put out there was a card game mixing my love for games because i really like board games with the work that i do with teams why not inventing is part of the process always learning is part of the process sometimes i wonder if i enjoy more the process of learning than the outcomes and what has come more apparent to me is that the way that we behave as society political the structures the systems that we invent they all conceptual systems they don't really tangibly exist we're making them up there are flaws in the system unless the system is designed to leave the place better than how we found it so in a very abstract way in a very meta 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 way there are similarities i come from communications background that's what i study i landed in the agile world by being interested of how others do better what they do. So I, I end up working in internal communication. And yes, digital has a lot to do, a lot of tools, a lot of things that can help there. But at the end of the day, are humans' problems uh, that we are trying to solve. So was that why you, because I, I noticed on LinkedIn, you kind of, you started off at Le Pain de Cotillier, a kind of restaurant. Was that where you had that communication experience? I, I've done lots of jobs in my life from promo and from my family business is a wine shop. And oh, you know, really? love, oh, cool. if you want to get to my heart, you do that also through my tummy. Um, Lots of different jobs. And um, I study comms. It used to be a double degree, PR, advertising, marketing, da, 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 five years. And I was already working for tourism of Girona, of the city where I was studying. Then I ended up working as well for Segway. I don't know if many of you will remember. Yeah. Two wheels, one platform is supposed to revolutionize. So part of my job was convincing politicians to jump into this thing. Over summer, uh, in August, everybody disappears. So I said to my boss, um, I'm going to go to London for a month. That's how I landed here. And I was finishing my uni there. Like sometimes I will take the first plane in the morning, coming back the last one at night just to present my final project and very intense. And I did all sorts of jobs because I was holding my rental flat there, my rental flat and life over here. And uh, so all sorts of different things. And, and for me, it came apparent that over time, I kind of miss the big boom of social media. And for a communicator, somebody that wanted to build their professional career around that, well, it was a big moment to kind of be doing all sorts of things. So you, you find your pace and you find your ways to go back to do what you love. And so I end up coming back into internal comms and in one of the organizations that I was working, actually, they were trying to embed Salesforce into the internal tools. So that kind of came to mind and I read a lot and I really like to experiment sometimes with humans uh, in a way that how we organize, how can we make it more engaging? How can we make it more satisfying the time? Because the time that we have is perishable. So we re should really make the most out of it. And with that, uh, my investigation start reading, hearing Agile this, Agile that. So I borrow bits. And I try stuff with my team. Things didn't ferment right. I think over time I came to the conclusion. Was that based on just you learning yourself or did you go on training to learn Agile at that point? Yeah, at that point. And I was like, hmm. So what I decided to do is to put myself through the Scrum Master certification. Scrum is a framework that applies some of the principles of Agile and extends with some, call it ceremonies, but some touch points into your delivery cycle to help you to align with your team, help you to get better at your process. Essentially, it's that. And so going through those motions and then I finished, there are several paths into the Scrum mastery <laughs> sort of professional path. And I finished that like a few years ago. So there is always learning and things become more clear as more that you do at the end of the day it's a practice yeah it's not just about i always think of it as like you can kind of 
functionally know it, I suppose, but that doesn't give you enough. You know, you need to actually practice, experiment with it, play with it, really learn it and see what works for you. And yeah, and just that kind of experience of doing it, but also that kind of X factor of what I get a kick out of my burn down graph or whatever it is that kind of drives you to improve and to do better. Some of the analogies, I think uh, they are commonly used. I hope I'm not like butchering the idea, but from the film of uh, Karate Kid, where the kid is being told to watch the car, um, but he wants to learn karate. You just do what the master says. Do it, do it, do it. And then those forms and those mannerisms and those disciplines, they come to use later on. So in a sense, it's a bit like this. Uh, you practice and then you will just get better. Yeah, definitely. And I think also just learning things that are kind of outside of your industry or your area of expertise, I suppose. And I found, I learned that quite early on when I kind of worked in film post-production. Um, it, you know, agile in film post-production does not exist. But a lot of the concepts from Agile, they were using, and it was as they just called it the film pipeline. It was just there doing the show and tells every morning to show what had progressed the previous day. The wall of, well, at the time before it all got digitalized, the wall of all the shots and the stages of production. So you could literally pick, see, looking at the wall, exactly where the film set. But also they had things that I didn't use in my kind of coding world that I kind of picked up and kind of thought, oh, that's quite interesting. But yeah, also, actually, when I was reading your book, I've got them here, actually, your kind of agile, becoming agile, and I haven't quite finished. I've got a little way through, so it's sustainable, happy, profit, profit, but not there. But especially with your agile book, like your references to other materials, other books and stuff, that because I'm a big reader, and there's loads, actually, a lot of the books, like, yeah, just seven habits of highly effective people, you know, the cornerstone i suppose of classic books but there's a couple of others that i just had never lit read which i've started got on an audiobook yeah drive the surprising truth that motivates us that not read but yeah fascinating so how with the books what drove you to go what today i'm going to write a book <laughs> your passion for agile what, what drove you to do it so it wasn't a day decision of a time what came more apparent is that i only have certain hours a day and I really want to be, I'm on this quest to demystify back then what Agile was about, but to help others to see that there is a better way to do business. I can see that there is a commonality of, of the messages, subliminal or maybe not so subliminal messages I'm trying to fit into this content. Creating a product where you do the effort once and can span in a way wider that I could do with, which I love to do anyway with articles and community conferences and supporting um, local community groups and all of that. I will do and continue to do. It's a way to extend the influence, hopefully, to reach others, to give them the tools, the ability, and to debunk so many myths. There is a better way to do business. There is a better way to enjoy work. There is a better way to spend your perishable time. Let's do it. I have fun. And I think also, especially with the, I always found like, especially around sustainability, diversity, and all this, all this kind of stuff. The companies were kind of almost like, go on this training course and learn this because we need to look like we're being sustainable and diverse. And then you come back, and then but they don't really kind of engage with actually making a change in their in their business. And I don't know, I kind of seen like even in the last couple of years, a kind of a bit of a seismic shift into companies going, well, actually, we really need to look at our product creation process and seeing really how we can be more sustainable and more environmentally friendly, I suppose. So what from some of the, from the Agile book and moving into this the kind of sustainable, happy profit, was that just that, that just came about with working with companies and wanting to move and learn more about that kind of side of business? It was a very selfish quest where at personal level, I made changes and I continue trying to evolve in the way that I can reduce my footprint and leave the place better than how I find it. Um, and it's hard. It's hard in terms of decisions that you make, things that you purchase or you don't purchase or things that you grow yourself. So wish me luck with my tomatoes this year. Um, so there are many, many things that we can do. And I think in general, there has been a wider educational piece and awareness piece into the wider population at the masses. And 
there is a common understanding at the system level, at the political level, that we need to change. Um, yet, as a one-person company, it was very difficult for me to translate some of those ideas into how do I run my LTD better? So that was a very selfish quest that I started. I start reading lots of things. There is a myriad of information. It can get really overwhelming. Lots of different frameworks, lots of different things to account for. And I took the path of talking with the organizations that they were doing things differently. Over two, three years, I had fantastic conversations and I learned a lot from others. And some things surfaced, some frames, some tools, some actions I started practicing, you know, I was my own lab rat um, with my own company in the way that I may not engage with certain industries anymore to do the work that I do. Every single decision that we take can leave the place better. So it's really up to us. So knowing that this masses of population is kind of aware as a consumer, for me, it's very difficult. I was doing a French drain because of some dump issues in the house, blah, blah, blah. To be able to find the right product that is either upcycle or it doesn't have big damage is really hard. So all those things that I learned and those things that I was practicing, if it didn't feel fair for me just to keep it for me because I already published another book, I thought, let's re reuse the framework. And there you go. In the, the second book, The Sustainable Happy Profit Came to Life. At the very end, I had this revelation of, oh, I'm just going to fit Scope Crypt. I'm going to fit a handbook at the end to help even more tangible. I think we really like like one page or two pages because there is just so much going on. So people can quickly like refer back and look at it. So yeah, that was a big extra scope against the clock. But I'm hearing good things from it. So. It's also, it's like the kind of the myths of, I like I always drives me nuts with you're recycling your plastic at home kind of thing. But actually it's not recycling, it's downcycling because it can only be recycled down to another form of plastic, really, a park bench or whatever it may be, but it still ends up in as rubbish at the end of the line. It's still not. So really, eradicating plastic altogether is great. A first step, like Coca-Cola, still plastic bottles, biggest waste in the world, I think, for plastic. But also, it's, I think there was a, I read somewhere that it was somewhere that was eliminating single-use plastic. And loads of people going, oh, no, but I've seen those things where you're trying to put stuff into pots and sell it, buying it, and it's a complete disaster. But actually, by governments actually saying, hey, let's stop single-use plastics, just as an example, could drive the innovation to come up with alternatives that are a lot more environmentally friendly. So do you think that governments do have a part to play and it's not just kind of companies being able to, or is it literally, it's got to come from a company base? For me, it was the book, it was the revelation to find that we have this massive gap where politics is aware, yet has pressures and some systems constraint. I'm not going to solve our economic system in this conversation today, but there are some things there. The results are way too slow. And it has loopholes and they're not agile enough so at the speed of change that the world it deserves. At population level, I told you my own constraints in my consumerism decisions is very tough. I can empathize. Now we have this middle thing that is a great player in the marketplace, organizations. And you know what? They are made up of individuals, of us. And so Bringing back the designers, the ones that are creating, we creating products, software, how the things talk to each other, how much they talk to each other, how efficient it is, how much of it with it, every single decision, it can make a difference. It has to come from within. In terms of plastic, God, this is also a massive subject because we seem sometimes to design things for one function and Designing it for one function, it misses a heap of context. So if you design, plastic came about because it's an easy way to store liquids. We didn't think beyond that to where the materials come from. If you look at nature, a leaf has no toxicity on it. You can take one leaf out of the whole plant and the thing will continue absorbing energy producing nutrients. At the end, when it's done its job, it will go back to the ground and it will decompose into multiple different things. It doesn't become a leaf again. So, and the way that we design things is like, how can we make that in line with nature? 
Yeah, exactly. And I think also it's, it's that fallacy that actually doing, thinking that way will be less profitable for the business. I remember there's a company in Germany that made carpets and they basically looked at their whole supply chain and realized that all the raw materials that make up a carpet was constantly being cleaned at every different step of their process. And actually, just by looking at all these companies that were supplying those raw materials, they eliminated a lot of waste from just the cleaning and the you know the, the materials being used. So much so that the carpets were almost simpler more you know, created in, in and more basic such that actually when they fitted the carpets they wanted the customers to contact them in five years time so they could take the carpets back to then reuse those raw materials from it to create new carpets from it which then also helped the customer because then took away the carpet it all went back into the supply chain they got better relationships with the customer because they could offer a discount because obviously they're making our money off the carpet that they put in five ten years ago and just the whole circular nature of it and and that was all driven by, it all started, kicked off the process when I think it was the German government said the, the wastewater from factories had to be a lot cleaner than it was, and then just trying to reduce the amount of chemicals, but actually resulted in better profit and a more interesting way of creating their products as well. So Yeah, and there are great stories, I think. This idea of you want it cheap, good, or big too, actually you end up with something very mediocre. Um, in the work that we do, you see sometimes conversations are being very polarized and we end up something yeah, kind of in the middle. Mm, there are more variables. And um, I think when we look at the business, you can, in fact, deliver in a more sustainable way, on a happier way. And profits will be a result, not a compromise. When I speak with CEOs and the conversations goes down into the aim of the game, the vision of the organization is to generate more profit, I challenge. That is not an organizational vision. We have a big problem over here. Why do you exist? There has to be a purpose. I think we're entering in the age of purpose. Purpose economy. Purpose economy. <laughs> yeah. Profit is a result, a result of doing the things in a way that leaves the place better than how you found it. And I think that, that's, and it kind of as you said, it's like, the people and the masses wanting to work for those companies that are making a difference and that what I'm doing isn't damaging the environment. And then actually the good people, the people that are using their feet to walk to those companies, you start becoming less competitive almost just by the fact that you're not being sustainable and people can see that It'd be interesting how it moves on over the years i hope from competition to collaboration or my favorite word co-creation when you see that all parties and everybody has a place to play you achieve much more than generating resistance and putting effort on against fascinating for those who don't know where to contact you, if they wanted to contact or find out our books, where, where should they go? I would like to believe I'm easy to find. So if you go to Google, Ines Garcia Agile, Ines Garcia Salesforce, I should be out there. In the community of Salesforce, we use Twitter quite a bit. So there you can find me at Ines K, ZK, the second one. There is a story behind one day, one day we'll have time. This will be the good place to go, I suppose. Amazon, easy to find the books and the game and stuff. And um, and you're coming to London's Calling as well? Like, yes. Yes, yeah. brilliant. So uh, yeah, if you want to meet up there, maybe there as well. So brilliant, thanks so much. Um, is there anything else you wanted to shout out about while we're here? Well, one of my very last inventions, uh, if I may, we, we came together a few, bit, a few people from the community over the beginning of March 2020 where we start cooking things, entertain each other. You couldn't really go and eat uh, somewhere else. So we start showing up, look, I cook this, I cook that and bring something alive. Food is something that brings us together. That over time has become a cook. Book. We launch a cookbook. <laughs> Why <Yeah>. not? <laughs> Absolutely. A vegetarian one for what? It's plant based. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's plant based. A plant yeah, based. Yeah. yeah. We should definitely increase our percentage of plant based. It's very nutritious. It's uh, less footprint than I many, keep many things. to get it. Because, you yeah, know, we're vegetarians at home. We kind of, yeah, eating so I keep going, oh, let's get it at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
But Wicca is out on Amazon as well. Of course. All profits go to non-profit organizations that are focused to help those that they don't have enough to eat. So we're trying to like bring the love of food for the love of others. That is fantastic. Loving it. Well, look forward to seeing you at London's Calling. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Francis. It's been a pleasure.